Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Arnold Kling and Nick Schultz, co-authors of From Poverty to Prosperity, Intangible Assets, Hidden Liabilities, and the Lasting Triumph Over Scarcity. Thanks for coming, guys. Uh, you write in uh, uh, you write at the beginning of the book that economics is not what it used to be, and you draw a distinction between economics 1.0 and economics 2.0. Can you talk a little bit about what uh, what's behind the, that typology? All right, I'll take a shot, and you take a shot. The um, these are economists who don't make it into the mainstream media. Um, even though you know, they're perfectly respectable, of the 10 economists that we interviewed, four of them won Nobel Prizes. Two of them are often listed as potential prize winners, and the other four are no slackers either. But the media ignore them. More importantly, the mainstream media ignore their ideas. So but what we mean by economics 2.0 is they focus on intangibles. Typical economics 1.0 says, well, there's labor, there's land, there's capital. And these people focus on institutions, uh, things like property rights and so on, and also on ideas, innovation uh, as factors. And these are the intangible. You write that Economics 1.0 looks at the market as a mechanism for allocating a given amount of resources. Economics 2.0, the market is a mechanism for stimulating and filtering innovation. That when I read that, and of course in the book you, you give props to uh, Joseph Schumpeter, but it seems very uh, 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 coming out of a Schumpeterian tradition of that, you know, the gales of creative destruction are not about taking a set number of goods and distributing them, but constantly creating new ways of meeting or creating needs and demands and desires. Right. I, I think that's fair. And, and it gets to an important point, an important theme of the book, which is um, how you would think about uh, problem solving, how you would think about challenges that are faced. So if you if you think that the world is a sort of fixed pie and what you need to do is move around parts of it over here um, or, or parts of it over there, that's going to lead to one set of kind of policy responses, say, in the, in the context of, uh, uh, of politics. But if you instead say that, well, problems can be solved by innovation, uh, by new products, by new processes, uh, it opens up and enlarges how you might look at the world, how you might look at uh, political problems, how you look at social problems, how you think about economic development uh, and the like. So it, it's, a, it's, I think, a subtle but important reorientation in how people look at the world around them and the problems that they face. And, and I think it's important how innovation takes place. There's a, like a central conflict throughout the book between what Bill Easterly calls searchers and planners. So there are people who rely on plans, that's large bureaucracies, large organizations, and there are people who rely on trial and error. And my guess is if something like Reason TV, if they were trying to launch that out of a large network like CNN or NBC, there would be this gigantic committee of vice presidents involved and there would be years of planning and probably the budget for Xeroxing PowerPoint decks would be bigger than everything you've spent so far. Whereas you're probably just trying to throw things against the wall, try different things, try different revenue models and what have you. And that's, that's the way most innovation takes I, place. I uh, wish we had thought about a revenue model when we launched <laughs> this. That's uh, a gaping hole in our plan or our searching. Um, you, you mentioned pie. Talk about how food is an example uh, of a triumph over scarcity. Well, one, one uh, uh, this is actually Arnold's line, but I'll bring it up. One way of illustrating the, the dynamic that we're talking about is if you looked at um, uh, economic problems, say, f four or five generations ago, and you wanted to teach young people about economic problems that they face, you might give them the grapes of wrath. Uh, but today, if you wanted to talk about the plight of the poor, you might suggest uh, supersize me. So we, we now have, uh, especially in developed countries, uh, abundance is becomes, in a certain sense, its own problem. Uh, we've solved so many economic problems that uh, we have a new set of challenges. It's not that they aren't challenges. I mean, there are obese people, and this is something you have to deal with, but it's a categorically different kind of uh, problem that you're dealing with than, say, in the 1920s. Do you follow a Schumpeterian line, and he, was, uh, he, was, uh, he influenced other critiques of capitalism, that you know, one of the ways that capitalism goes away is because people get too fat and lazy, and they forget how wealth is created and how it is, uh, you know, how a society is nourished. Uh, are are you negative about the uh, the move to a post scarcity world? 
Go I'll take that. I, you know, I've, I've thought a lot about that, and I used to be, but I'm not anymore. And one reason is that, um, uh, say, in the United States, culturally, the entrepreneurial culture here is very strong. So uh, uh, yes, for some people, that may be the case. Uh, we're relatively successful. We have most of our basic needs met. Will people then continue uh, driving, striving, and innovating? But um, you know, the cultural makeup of the country is such that I don't think that's a, that's a problem. You're still going to have people who want to innovate, want to try new things, want to experiment, uh, and those sorts of things are going to, provided that that people can continue to do that, are going to continue to drive long run innovation. So I'm not um, uh, I'm not worried about it, at least in the context of the United States. Well, you know, the book doesn't actually answer that question. It's a good question, but the. Uh, the economics 2.0 very much emphasizes the role of culture and the individual attitudes in kind of shaping the economy. And so, uh, you know, some of the economics that we, we've learned over the last 50 years is just how important that culture is. You can't just sort of go into Iraq and change the culture overnight, or go into an African country and change the culture overnight. And hopefully, you can't go into, go into Am Michigan, America. right, and change the culture overnight. Yeah. Uh, is this a good time to write and release a book about the lasting triumph over scarcity? Uh, yeah, it's counterintuitive. We, we've joked uh, in the run-up to the book that maybe uh, we should call from poverty to prosperity and back to poverty again. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, somewhat counterintuitive. But um, I think, you know, one of the themes of the book is that a lot of the gains are pretty lasting. I mean, uh, uh, obviously we're in the middle of a pretty uh, rough economic time, but I remember uh, going to Japan, for example, the first time many, many years ago after Japan had had this lost decade, right? And I kept thinking, well, I'm going to go and there's going to be this horribly depressed society and uh, no energy, no vigor. And you go there, you would have no idea coming from the outside. So that there are gains that can be made that, that can be lasting. Uh, and I do think that this triumph over, over scarcity is, is real and, uh, and it's an important story and it's, it's an underappreciated one. And a useful exercise, and I actually gave this to my high school students, is to do a plot of real gross domestic product or real gross domestic product per person uh, over a long period from, let's say, that, you know, as, as far back as we have the data till now. And every recession in that plot shows up as a tiny little blip. Now, this one will show, be, show up as a bigger blip, but it'll still be, you know, 10, 15 years and out from now, it'll still appear to be a relatively tiny blip. Well, in a lot of ways, the problems from this will be less the kind of evaporation of, of capital and more the legacy of the rules and regulations of the institutional changes that get made. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, I describe this, I'm known for describing this as the great recalculation, meaning that there are there's going to be dramatic movements out of some industries and into others. On top of this, you have a new book, another new book. Yes, yeah, so well. I call that book two. It's called Unchecked and Unbalanced. And it's about the discrepancy that's emerging between knowledge being highly dispersed uh, and specialized, while power, political power, is becoming more concentrated. And Nick, you're the editor-in-chief of the American, American Enterprise Institute's publication. Uh, how, how does that uh, carry through the themes of your book? Well, uh, well we focus a lot on, at American.com on uh, economic growth and uh, another issue that, that, is, that is big in this book and is important to me, which is entrepreneurship. Uh, it's by no I mean, one of the things that we want, want the book to do is to point areas that people should be looking at uh, and spending more time thinking about because we're not presenting this as, well, here's the you know, set view of the world. Instead, it is here are areas of academic research, of just intellectual research that people should be doing, spending more attention to, spending more time on, and we do a lot of that uh, at The American, and so uh, that's how the two tie in together. Well, and it's uh, certainly clear that we are desperately in need of new economic frameworks and uh, kind of philosophical frameworks and probably even epistemological frameworks, since a lot of the explanations emanating from D.C., whether it's conservative or liberal, don't seem to be capturing uh, reality as we experience. I want to thank uh, Arnold Kling and Nick Schultz, authors of From po Poverty to Prosperity, Intangible Assets, Hidden Liabilities, and the Lasting Triumph Over Scarcity. And I would also like to thank Washington, D.C. for supplying more than enough ambient noise uh, during this interview. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.